A couple of YouTube woodworkers asked for help with their restoration project. And I'm a metal worker, so woodworking frightens and confuses me. So I said no. But then they said they wanted me to forge the blade for their plane. I expected to be making a full-sized airplane propeller from Damascus, which is a totally reasonable thing to agree to. I was a little surprised when they said they were going to mail me the plane and absolutely confounded when this arrived. I mean, what is it? I think this is some sort of woodworking bullshit. Indeed. So after a few short hours of investigation on YouTube, I had even more answers as to why my full-size Fokker triplane wasn't even a tiny Fokker triplane. It wasn't even an airplane at all. I know what it is. Here's what I learned. Turns out these parts go to a low angle bevel up block plane. Now, this is the main graddle. There are three graddles in every Stanley plane made before 1955. Nowadays, you're lucky to get two in anything but a model four, am I right? The graddle, which cuts the wood, is pinned to the shaft tab by this emulite fastener known as a D's. Now, if we turn the shaft tab over, we can see that this D's is missing a nut. Oh well. The shaft tab sits 1 16th inch back from the graddle, where it helps prevent excessive spalding. Remember, a well-tuned plane doesn't skip a baffle a spald. The graddle, D's fastener, and shaft tab comprise the Brady crank, which we know locates in the half mabel slot of the staple housing right in front of our studer pipe, our studer pipe. Oh no, this dangle spool should already be installed. All right, so this is what I want to try here. I want to make a wood plane iron out of Damascus. So I got a pattern on top and I would do some plug welds. That's a lot of plug welding. It seems ambitious for a guy who's never done it outside a canister. So there'll be some degree of plug welding, probably not six. But the issue with Damascus and a super fine edge, if I read correct, is that uh, you have two different steels here, right? 1084 and 15 and 20. The 1084 will be harder after heat treating and tempering than the 15 and 20. And the 15 and 20 will have different carbides. It's got different alloys than the 1084. And basically the problem is that they're going to wear down at different rates across an edge. So you'll have essentially micro serrations instead of one smooth flat edge, if I read correctly. A mono steel would make a better uh, fine cutting instrument. For example, if you're shaving your face with a straight razor, you would want it out of a mono steel instead of Damascus, if that's true. So this wood plane blade, we want to take super thin slices of wood so fine you can see through it. And so I'm thinking a mono steel belongs on the cutting edge. So there's a couple ways to do that. The first is to forge weld Damascus to a mono steel and hope and pray that this forge weld line is straight enough that when you grind everything down thin enough that one steel doesn't poke through the side of the other. That's a big risk. The other option that I could come up with is, look at that, so cute, is uh, that you have your piece of Damascus and then you forge weld at an angle, the cutting edge, and if, if this angle were shallower, you essentially wouldn't be able to see the mono steel on the top portion, but it would go far enough back on the bottom to make a good cutting edge. And um, long story short, I'm going with this method. First up, we're gonna forge our plug with alternating layers of 15 and 20 and 1084 steel. Now. When you plug weld, you take what is usually a round piece of steel, place it into a very snug hole in another piece of steel, and then hammer or press everything flat so that the sides of the plug press against the edges of the hole and everything actually forge welds up and becomes a solid piece of steel. I've never done this outside a canister, like I said. In this case, we're gonna make a piece of Damascus, mosaic Damascus, as our plug. We're gonna round it and then turn it on a lathe to make sure it's perfectly round. And then we'll cut our corresponding hole in our plane blade and uh, see if we can get that to plug weld. I had a lot of help from Joshua Prince on the plug welding side of this, so props to him. I'll tell you more about that later. Our pattern for the Damascus is going to be a mosaic. So what we're doing here is we're welding our layers together. I'll um, partially resquare them, then flatten them in the opposite dimension so that we'll get some W's. We're gonna cut and restack that bar and forge weld that into a square. Then we'll cut that long square bar into four pieces, which we'll set into a square and forge weld that together. And that'll form a diamond in the middle. Then we'll 
draw out that square bar again, cut it into four pieces another time, weld those four pieces again into another cube or square, then we'll draw that out. This is the piece that we'll hammer around and then turn it on a lathe and that'll be our plug. We're cleaning up stage one of our billet. We're going to get it flattened, then we're going to cut it up into pieces, stack those pieces on top of each other and reforge weld them together. This will give us some crushed W's. We're going to re-square this on its corners and draw it out into a long square bar. And again, we'll clean that up, cut that into four pieces, and set those four pieces next to each other. And since we re-squared it on its corners, this is going to give us a little diamond shape pattern. You'll see in just a second. Yeah, so there's our diamond shape pattern. Now again, we're going to forge weld these together, draw this out again into a square bar, cut it up, and reforge it into another square. Yep, time to restack it, tack it, forge weld it together. This is going to be our final bit that we're going to uh, round out and make our plug out of. So the pattern should be complete after this weld.
Yeah, so this is turning out pretty good. I'm going to put this into a canister next with some titanium dioxide walls and stainless steel to keep it from sticking to the canister, subject it to super high heats to make sure there's good grain growth and all the layers are going to stick together as I, as I forge it into a circle. And here it is. So far, so good. Now I've got to turn this on a lathe to make it perfectly round for our plug. This is an old billet that I made some knives out of, the uh, one billet, two knives video. And uh, I haven't really done anything with it. I can make some more knives with it, but I think I'm going to try to um, shape it up and then forge weld bits together, uh, we'll fatten it up, and we'll get um, the decorative portion of our blade out of that. So. Nothing too exciting here, we're just forging this out flat, we'll cut it into pieces which we'll stack on top of each other to weld and uh, draw out on its side. I'm going to put an extra piece of 1084 in that mix so we can get some uh, better spacing and more material. And fast forward, the larger piece here is the blade material we just forged out to very specific dimensions so that our 15 and 20 would fit on top. And that smaller bit's the 15 and 20. We have to forge weld this together, draw it out to the dimensions of our blade, actually a little bit larger than what we need. So the weld looks clean, the dimensions are correct, and it looks very good from the side. It looks like our two layers are very flat against each other so that when we grind this down, we hopefully won't get one side bleeding through into the other. Now, from here, things are gonna get more complicated. This, this is sort of the easy stuff that we've done. <laughs> Stay tuned for part two, and we'll get into our plug weld and getting this blade shaped up. You guys have a good one. Hello, here is the North American woodworker and his close relatives the European and Pan-Asian varieties. By sound, you cannot tell them apart as all woodworking species are born with a Canadian accent. Visually, the North American woodworker is to be distinguished by his use of overalls and the presence of an oversized beard. Here we see a baby woodworker being born. Hello, little fella. As soon as he is out of the womb, this tiny carpenter will search out two things, his mother's milk and plans for Lazy Susan. This two-year-old woodworker is playing with a toy hammer like all the normal toddlers around him. Unlike the normal children, however, he has collected six different identical toy hammers and arranged them neatly poking out of his diaper. Scientists have long observed the senseless and expensive hoarding of redundant tooling in nearly all woodworking species. This trait often precedes another developmental trait, the overcomplication of remedial tasks. Here we see a teenage North American woodworker. Awkward, gangly, and out of place. He does not dance or socialize. Despite his size, he lacks the mental capacity for organized sports. Luckily, he will find a home in his high school shop class, taking his place amongst other members of his flock. In contrast to the North American woodworking teenager, the European one is highly reproductive, as teenagers' local wildlife authorities will confiscate their testicles until a mastery of joinery is demonstrated. The gonads are then returned in a plastic baggie like this one. Oh, happy day. Shh. Carefully now, here our wildlife specialist Gerald approaches a full-grown adult. We are at a home improvement store, the woodworker's natural habitat. Be wary. Woodworkers are often irritable due to frequent injuries to fingers and toes. Gerald has spotted three band-aids on this specimen's right hand. Careful, Gerald. Using a quiet voice and small words, the woodworker is appeased. Success! Gerald has been accepted into the flock. This woodworker's exaggerated arm movements indicate he is informing Gerald about his favorite drywall nail and how he sharpens his own drill bits. 
The North American woodworker is truly a remarkable species. Take a minute to think about what our lives would be like without...